Good morning. Welcome to our study this morning. Uh, we're glad that you're here, and I'm glad that I'm here, and that you can see what's going on uh, after our technical difficulties. Uh, today's lesson is Lesson 16 in our Revelation series. This is the pre-wrath rapture. Last week we did the introduction uh, to the pre-tribulation rapture and did that in relatively brief form because I said when we get to the uh, objections and contradictions part of our study that we would see it more in more detail. Uh, so this week I planned on doing a similar uh, simple introduction to the pre-wrath rapture. However, uh, I decided that we would do a more extensive one uh, since this is a very controversial subject and uh, it has a lot of elements to it just to understand what they're saying uh, at the beginning without even going to the objections and contradictions stage. So I'm going to go ahead and give you the pre-wrath rapture presentation by one of the authors of one of the several pre-wrath rapture books. And he's also featured in their uh, videos on explaining the pre-wrath rapture and arguing for it. So it's this is going to be the whole hour. We'll be seeing it from his own words so that we know exactly what they're saying and why. So let's begin with the word of prayer and then we'll get started. Father, we are grateful for the opportunity to meet, to study your plan for the ages, your plan for eternity, your plan for our lives. We thank you that you have given us all of this information in your word and that by looking at your word, we can determine those things that are of significance to us. As we look at this study today, we ask that you show us what uh, the presentation of the pre-wrath rapture is about so that we may, might have good understanding for it when we go into uh, further analysis. Uh, also show us if the pre-wrath rapture is the actual plan that you have for us that we will be able to see that as we study. We thank you for all of this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Okay, uh, A Case for the Pre-Wrath Rapture by Alan Hultberg. Uh, he's, as I said, one of the many authors of the many books, and the, uh, they have a wonderful presentation on YouTube or on their website. Um, they're on both locations. Um, that you can watch. Uh, it's about, I think it's about like an hour and a half long. Uh, and it's all of the different authors, proponents of the pre-wrath rapture uh, giving a presentation. I, I will tell you this, they spend most of their presentation arguing against the pre-tribulation rapture and there's not much really on the pre-wrath rapture. Um, so that's why I'm pretty much giving you this. Their case in that video is the pre-tribulation rapture can't be true, so this must be true. Uh, so we're going to look at, uh, try to find out why they think this is true uh, and uh, not find out why they think the pre-trib rapture is false. All right, the pre-wrath rapture position rests on two major theses that the church will enter the last half of Daniel's 70th week and that between the rapture of the church and the return of Christ to earth will be a significant period of extraordinary divine wrath. Okay, So those are there too. One, So those are the, the theses that he will 
develop to essentially prove that the pre-wrath rapture is correct. If these two theses are demonstrated, then of necessity, the rapture can neither be pre-tribulational, a position that requires that the rapture occur before the middle of Daniel's 70th week, though that usually argues for a rapture before the beginning of that week, nor post-tribulational, in the classic sense, a position that requires no significant period of time intervening between the rapture and the return of Christ to the earth. Okay, so if those two theses are correct, then there can't be a pre-trib and there can't be a post-trib. It seems to me, however, and this is Holtberg, uh, all of this is Holtberg, I, I may, I don't think I have any comments of my own in here, because I didn't want to. Uh, it seems to me, Holtberg says, however, that absolute demonstration of these points is close to impossible, since much of the evidence is patient of multiple interpretations. I will thus seek in this essay to demonstrate the probability of the pre-wrath rapture, that is, that the most probable reading of the evidence serves to support the two major theses of this position. My argument will proceed by demonstrating these theses in turn. First, I will show that the church will enter the last half of Daniel's 70th week. Then I will show that the church will be raptured before the end of that week, prior to the outpouring of God's wrath. We begin then with evidence for the first theses. So here's what he's saying. You remember all of our diagrams that we've done about the timeline. And uh, this will be the, well, this will be eternity future. This will be the millennium. This will be the, I'm going to make the tribulation bigger than it should be if we were doing the scale. So this is the uh, seven years, we'll call it, because pre-wrath rapturists don't like to call it the tribulation. Um, they prefer to refer to it as the, the seven-year period or the Daniel 70th week or the time of Jacob's trouble, which are all fine. Um, and, and what they say is that, what he's referring to here, is that at the midpoint, you have the abomination of desolation at the three and a half years, and that's, that's certainly spoken of in the book of Revelation. And then following that, you have, um, I'm going to call it W-O-G, the wrath of God. Okay. And that the wrath of God then uh, goes until you get to um, the last day and so this period this first three and a half is prior to the Antichrist setting up in the temple okay the Antichrist uh, stops all of the sacrifices, sits himself or his image in the Holy of Holies, and proclaims himself to be God. Okay? That's the beginning then of God's wrath. They place that, they place that at the, uh, the seventh seal time. Okay. So just so you have an idea of what he's talking about, uh, the church will enter the last half of Daniel's 70th week and will be raptured before the end of the week prior to the outpouring of God's wrath. Because that sounds like the end of the week is the outpouring of God's wrath, but that's not what they're saying. They're saying that the last three and a half years will contain the outpouring of God's wrath. Okay. Just wanted to clarify that point with a diagram. The first thesis, the church will enter 
the second half of Daniel's 70th week. Three passages in Scripture are especially important in demonstrating that the church will enter the last half of Daniel's 70th week. The Olivet Discourse, that's Matthew 24 and uh, part of 25, 2 Thessalonians 2, and Revelation. That's what he says. Okay, that's, that's basically he's defined his, his parameters. In the Olivet Discourse, Jesus seems, seems to indicate that his disciples would see both the Danielic abomination of desolation and the subsequent tribulation. Matthew 24, uh, Mark 13. Now, um, in your emails, I gave you the printouts of all of the passages that contain these references. So you have the Matthew, you have Mark, you have Thessalonians, and you have Daniel. Um, those of you who are in attendance do not have those, uh, but you don't really have to have them. They're just so you can look at them if you want to. Okay? So, um, and that they're going to see both the Danielic abomination of desolation and the subsequent tribulation immediately prior to his parousia, his, his coming, to his, before his coming, that's the parousia, his presence. Paul appears to expect the former in 2 Thessalonians 2, and John appears to expect at least the latter in Revelation 2, 7, 13, and 17. Okay. So here are those passages. Matthew 24, 15 through 22. So when you see the abomination that lays waste, or the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, set up in the set apart place, that's the holy place, he who reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Yehuda, Judah, Judea, flee to the mountains. Let him who is in the housetop not come down to take whatever out of his house. And let him who is in the field not turn back to get his garment. So this is what, Matthew, uh, what Jesus says in Matthew 24. And you recall that. We covered that uh, before uh, when we said uh, Jesus, they had left the temple. And while they were at the temple, uh, Jesus said, not one stone will be left. Okay? So then they went up on the Mount of Olives and the disciple, privately, just the disciples, and they ask him, uh, when will this be and when, what will be the sign of your coming? Okay. Two different questions. So this is his answer, and we're already into his answer a ways uh, when Hultberg picks it up because he wants to show you that, that they're going to see the abomination of desolation and the tribulation that follows. Right? Okay. So that's why he starts here. And woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing children in those days and pray that your flight does not take place in winter or on the Sabbath, for then there shall be great distress, such as not, has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And if those days were not shortened, no flesh would be saved. For the, but for the sake of the chosen ones, those days will be shortened. So there will be a shortening of the time frame um, for the sake of the chosen or the elect ones. Now here's the Mark passage. Uh, Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21 are all passages, parallel passages to one another with a little bit of information change in each one depending on who asks the question and and who the audience is, he, he gives a slightly varied answer, but nothing of great significance, okay? Nothing that changes the meaning of any of them. So Mark 13, 14 through 20 says, And when you see the abomination that lays waste, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, set up where it should not be. Set up where it should not be, okay? There should not be anything in the Holy of Holies except the... Uh, the uh, Ark of the Covenant 
and all of that, okay? The ark, essentially, you could call it. Um, he who reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in uh, Judea or Jehuda flee to the mountains. Okay, so what's different here? The abomination of desolation in Matthew here, uh, uh, he adds set up where it should not be. Matthew says in the holy place. He says set up where it should not be. So that gives us a little more insight into it. It should not be there. And he who is on the housetop, let him not go down into the house, nor come in to take whatever out of his house. And he who is in the field, let him not go back to get his cloak. And woe to those who are pregnant, to those nursing children in those days, and pray that your flight does not take place in winter. So uh, this doesn't have anything to do with the pre-wrath rapture, but just an insight into, into this. If we knew the time that this was going to take place, then there would be no need to say, uh, pray that your flight does not take place. Uh, take place in winter because he would know when it was going to take place and and he would say oh watch out it's in winter and and uh, so so that's something to kind of keep in the back of your mind we'll get to the explanation of that later for in those days there shall be distress such as has not been from the beginning of creation which elohim created until this time nor shall ever be and if the master had not shortened those days, no flesh would have been saved. But because of the chosen ones whom he chose, he shortened the days. So that's the Mark passage. This is the second Thessalonians passage that he's referred to, where they're expecting these things. As to the coming of our master Messiah and our uh, uh, Yahushua Messiah, and our gathering together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled in mind or troubled, either by spirit by word or by letter, as if from us, as if the day of Yahushua has come. Okay. I'm sorry, uh, Yahuwah, this is the Father, Yahuwah has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, because the falling away is to come first. That's also translated as the rebellion or the apostasy. Uh, and the man of lawlessness is to be revealed. That's the Antichrist. Uh, He's also known as the son of destruction. So what Paul says there in, in chapter 2, verse 2, not to become easily unsettled in mind or troubled, either by spirit, some um, spirit that speaks, right? like in a meeting where someone has a prophecy or a word of knowledge, something of that nature, or by word, by someone saying, hey, we just left Paul and he said this. Uh, or by letter, or someone says, hey, I have this letter that Paul just wrote. And that's why he says, as if from us. None of these things, uh, if, they're, if they're said to be from us, uh, don't pay any attention to it because the day of Yahuwah has not come. Okay? And, they, and they say that it has. That's a key point. The day of Yahuwah has come. Okay? Uh, we'll see that come up here again later. So he comes and he opposes and exalts himself above all that is called Elohim, or that is worship, so that he sits as Elohim in the dwelling place of Elohim, showing himself that he is Elohim. Do you not remember that I told you this while I was with you? Still with you. Okay. So when Paul evangelized uh, Thessalonica and that area of Macedonia, he told them these things. Now, when did Paul write the letter to the Thessalonians? It was his very first letter he wrote. The very first letter he wrote. So sometime prior to writing the very first letter that he wrote, he told them this information. So we know that it's not information that's contained in any of the subsequent uh, letters, uh, or let's put it this way, not originally uh, referenced in the subsequent letter. So, so Thessalonians 
and then Corinthians, then Galatians, then Romans, then Philippians, then Colossians, then Ephesians, then First and Second Timothy and Titus. Okay, those are the subsequent letters to the Thessalonians. So this was new information that Paul had not shared by letter with anyone else, though he could have told someone else, uh, but just never referenced it in a letter. And the lawless one shall be revealed, whom the master shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and bring to naught with the manifestation of his coming. So when Jesus comes, he'll destroy the uh, Antichrist, the lawless one, uh, with his mouth, okay, just by speaking. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power and signs and wonders of falsehood, and with all deceit of unrighteousness in those perishing, because they did not receive the love of the truth in order for them to be saved. So they did not receive the truth, uh, and therefore they're not saved, and therefore they are prone to deception. And for this reason, Elohim sends them a working of delusion for them to believe the falsehood. You reject the Messiah, all right, you get to be deceived. In order that all should be judged who did not believe the truth, but have delighted in the unrighteousness. So why didn't they believe the truth? They delighted in the unrighteousness. It's repeated in other places that people love pleasure more than God. Okay? So they choose pleasure, uh, their unrighteous pleasures, uh, instead of choosing God. Okay? And that's pretty much always the truth. If you're speaking to someone about the Lord uh, and they say, I don't believe that, say, why don't you believe that? Well, because I don't think it's true. Well, what? What if it is true? What effect would it have on your life? Well, I couldn't uh, do such and such, or I couldn't uh, have such and such, or I'd have, they'll have some reason of their pleasure, their desires, their motivational patterns uh, that keep them from wanting to believe something that would make them change. Now, a lot of times that's their understanding is erroneous. And they think, well, if you're, you know, you have to be a monk, you have to be a, 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 a total ascetic if you're going to be a, a Christian, if you're going to believe Christ. So a lot of times you can then talk to them about it. Oh, no, 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 that's, that's not true. That's not what the Bible says. Um, and, and reach them that way. Uh, but in a great majority of cases, they won't accept any reason to believe because they they delight in their unrighteousness. Okay, uh, but we ought to give thanks to Elohim always for you, brothers, beloved by the Master, because Elohim from the beginning chose you to be saved in set-apartness of spirit and belief in the truth. So that's how you're saved, set-apartness of spirit and belief in the truth. That's the salvation of the Thessalonians under which he called you by our good news, our gospel, for the obtaining of the esteem, the glory of our master, uh, Yahushua Messiah. So then, brother, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or by our letter. Okay, so Paul is actually given, giving, has given them traditions that are of value. Now, most of the time, traditions are of no value in their contrary. Jesus taught against the traditions of the religious leaders in Judea all the time. Uh, but this, Paul says these traditions are of value. And our master, Yahushua Messiah himself, and our Elohim and Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting encouragement and good expectation through favor, encourage your hearts and establish you in every good uh, word and work in Second Thessalonians 2. So back to Hultberg uh, in his presentation. In what follows, I will attempt to show that in each of these cases, the ones we just read, Matthew 24, 2 Thessalonians, and uh, uh, we're, we're not doing the Revelation uh, verses because they're actually part of 
his second thesis, so I didn't give you all of them, because those were like, what, five chapters of the book of Revelation. Okay. Uh, I will attempt to show that in each of these cases, the author does, in fact, expect the church to see the abomination of desolation or to experience the Danielic tribulation and thus to enter the last half of Daniel's 70th week. If any of my arguments prove successful, then this part of the case for a pre-wrath rapture will have been made. The case, of course, is considerably strengthened if all the arguments prove successful. We will begin with a consideration of the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24. The Olivet Discourse is a response by Jesus to his disciples' question concerning the end of the age. Their question was elicited by Jesus' prediction of the destruction of the Jewish temple, and their assumption seems to have been that the destruction of the temple was an eschatological event. Jesus' response is designed in part to distinguish the first century destruction of the temple from the end of the age when the Son of Man comes. Remember I said they asked two questions. Uh, uh, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming? That's what he's talking about here. Thus Jesus notes that the disciples will see certain catastrophic events surrounding the destruction of the temple, but that, ex but that explicitly do not signal the end. Right? They will see them, but that does not explicitly signal the end. Uh, this is the text for that. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah, and they shall lead many astray. And you shall begin to hear of fightings and reports of fightings, wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled, for these have to take place, but the end is not yet. And essentially what that says is, but the end hasn't started yet. Okay. These things are going to happen, but that's not the start of the end. For a nation shall rise against nation, and, and kingdom against kingdom. I'm going to stop there and give you that information. It says, for a nation shall rise against nation. Those are, eth the word there is ethnos. Let's just do it right here. Ethnos. Ethnic groups. Okay. Ethnic groups. Not nations like we think of countries. Okay. So ethnic groups will, uh, will rise against other ethnic groups and kingdoms against kingdoms. That, those are countries then. Those are those are governments and countries. Right? And there shall be scarcities of food, famine, and deadly diseases, pestilences, and earthquakes in places. And all these are the beginning of birth pains. Right? So just like labor pains uh, start off uh, very mild, nothing to them, no problem, unless you're a woman. Uh, then, there, then there's something to worry about, something to experience. And all these are the beginning of birth pangs. Then they shall deliver you up to affliction and kill you. And you shall be hated by all ethnic groups for my namesake. And then many shall stumble, and they shall deliver up one another and shall hate one another. In other words, the... the, the uh, the Jews here will turn on each other. And many false prophets will rise up and lead many astray. And because of the increase in lawlessness, the love of many shall become cold. The actual uh, original says because of the uh, lack of Torah, okay, the lack of Torah, uh, the leaving of Torah, the abandonment of Torah, the love of many shall become cold. But he who shall have endured to the end will be saved. So all of these things that happen, the one who endures through them all to the end will be saved. These, Jesus says, are merely the beginning of birth pains. The primary sign of the end will be the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, which will initiate the great Danielic tribulation. Remember the 
the abomination of desolation takes place three and a half years into what we have traditionally always called the tribulation, but they only refer to as the seven year period, the 70th week of Daniel, the time of Jacob's trouble. So I want you to understand what he's speaking of when we talk about that time frame. So, so they're going to see it the middle of the week, and that starts the tribulation for his presentation. Daniel 12, 1. Now at that time, Michael shall stand up, the great head who is standing over the sons of your people. Michael is the archangel for Israel. Okay. That's what he said. Remember in Daniel, we talked about it when Gabriel said uh, that Michael was going to come help him against the prince of uh, Persia and the prince of uh, Ulan, uh, that, uh, and he is, he is your prince, prince of your people. Okay? And there shall be a time of distress such as never was since there was a, a nation, since there were ethnic groups until that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. So here's how you see modification. Uh, in the Bible, everyone, uh, oh, I'll put it, read it again, and at that time, your people shall be delivered. Modification, everyone who is found written in the book, which means that there will be those who will not be delivered. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth wake up, some to everlasting life, and some to reproaches, everlasting abhorrence. Everlasting uh, destruction, Gehenna hell. Okay, that's what he's referring to. This tribulation will end when the sign of the Son of Man shall appear in the sky and the angels will gather his elect from the four winds. That's what Matthew 29, 31 says. Uh, Though the disciples would see a, a proleptic fulfillment of these events in the destruction of Jerusalem, the end of the age and the coming of the Son of Man were yet future. And then we pick it up in Matthew 24, 29 through 31. And immediately after the distress of those days, that is the word uh, uh, philipsis that's also translated tribulation. And immediately after the tribulation or distress of those days, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give its light and the stars shall fall from the heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then the sign of the son of Adam, or the son of man, shall appear in the heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth shall mourn, and they shall see the son of Adam, the son of man, coming on the clouds of the heaven with power and much esteem. Now, those of you who are around for um, uh, some of the uh, studies on the Passover, remember this, Jesus saying this to the high priest, at which point the high priest rent his robe, tore his robe, which actually disqualified him from the priesthood. That was in, in Leviticus, I think. Uh, that, that's one of the things that the high priest could never tear his robe uh, in anger or he would be disqualified from the priesthood. Well, the reason for that, this is a quote from the Psalms and essentially it says the following uh, verses in that Psalm say that Jesus is the chief high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And that's what angered uh, the high priest is that Jesus was saying, your priesthood uh, will be over when you see me coming on the clouds of heaven with power and glory. So that's a reference back to that, just to give you a little concept of what, uh, what it, that's all about. And uh, so you'll see him coming on the clouds of heaven with power and much esteem, and he shall send his messengers with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his chosen ones from the four winds, from one end of heavens to the other. Okay. So 
look again at verse 29. And immediately after the distress of those days, the sun shall be dark and the moon shall not give its light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then when you look at 31, that's when he sends his messengers, his angels, with a great sound of a trumpet and they will gather his chosen ones from the four winds from the uh, one end of the heavens to the other. Okay. So when does he gather his people? After the distress of those days, the sun and the moon and the stars and all of and the sign of the Son of Man. Okay. The disciples are thus dis, uh, addressed as both primary witnesses of these tribulational events and as representatives of the final ge generation. The context of the Olivet Discourse is thoroughly Jewish. Remember, this is Holtberg. You know, I, I'm not in here. Uh, anything I'm reading is Holtberg. Uh, the context of the Olivet Discourse is thoroughly Jewish, and this has led most pre-tribulationalists to deny that the church is in view in this chapter, especially as the elect of the final generation who are gathered at the end of the age and who are addressed representatively in the warnings to the disciples. So, for example, Renald Showers uh, points to one, the Jewish reference uh, references in the Old Testament allusions in the discourse. Number two, the Jewish environment of the discourse and its warnings. And three, the fact that Gentiles aren't explicitly addressed as a topic till Matthew 25 as proof that Jesus addresses the Olivet Discourse to his disciples as Jews. John Walford adds that the nature, and John Walford's also a pre-tribulationalist, adds that the nature of the disciples' question a question that assumes Jewish kingdom hopes points to the Jewish nature of Jesus' discourse. And then none of these assertions are objectionable. Shower's uh, points and Walver's points are not objectionable. The disciples do not view themselves, nor are they treated by Jesus in Matthew, as anything other than faithful Jews who are beginning the community of the Messiah. So there's agreement on all of that. It is not surprising then that the question and response recorded in the Olivet Discourse have such a Jewish character, but neither do they show that the church is not in view in the Olivet Discourse. Unless one begins with the assumption of a radical discontinuity between the church and Israel. This assumption, however, is very unlikely. Space does not permit a full discussion of this topic. It will suffice for our purposes to show that for Matthew, the church is viewed as in some sense the inheritor of the Jewish kingdom, with the destruction of Jerusalem playing a significant role in the transition, and that the disciples form the core of the new messianic community. That Matthew has such a view can be seen in the following lines of evidence. Number one, Israel comes to its fulfillment in Jesus as Messiah. Quite apart from the clear motif in Matthew that as the promised Messiah Jesus brings the Old Testament to its fulfillment, summed up, summed up in Matthew 5.17, and seen, seen in the numerous fulfillment quotations, but attested in several other ways throughout the gospel, many scholars have noted that Matthew portrays Jesus as fulfilling the role of Israel itself. Okay. Don't need Israel anymore. Okay. Jesus has taken over. Thus, for example, in the early chapters of Matthew, Jesus, like eschatological Israel, is visited by Gentiles bearing gold and frankincense. Like Israel is called as God's son out of Egypt. And like Israel successfully endures temptation in the wilderness with filial obedience to the law. These are all reasons that Jesus has fulfilled Israel's plan in history. Later, he is presented as both suffering servant and the son of man, both corporate messianic figures representing Israel. Thus, for Matthew to belong to Israel, one must belong to the Messiah, Jesus. Okay? And that's perfectly true. 
to belong to Israel, one must belong to the Messiah, Jesus. Point two, Jesus founds a new community centered in the 12 apostles. Matthew is well known for explicitly presenting Jesus as founding a new community, the ecclesia. The language comes from the Greek translation of the Old Testament kahal, uh, kahal Israel, or congregation of Israel, and indicates that the messianic community that Jesus is founding is in some sense the true or new Israel. Furthermore, this community is centered in the 12 apostles, the number 12 representing a reconstitution of Israel. The impetus for founding this community is Jesus' rejection by unbelieving Jews. The Jewish rejection of Jesus leads to the rejection of Israel and the establishment of the church. A basic theme of Matthew's gospel is that Jesus, the king, preaches the kingdom of heaven to Israel, but is ultimately rejected by them. This theme comes to a head in the narratives of the Passion Week, where Jesus enters Jerusalem as the Messianic king, but is confronted and eventually killed by the Jewish authorities. In a series of parables and denunciations leading up to the Olivet Discourse and the plot to kill him, Jesus condemns Jewish unbelief and announces the disinheritance of Israel. The parable of the vineyard is most significant. Jesus concludes the parable by announcing to the chief priests and elders of the people that as a result of their rejection of him, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. The fact that Jesus gives the kingdom to another ethnos and that, oh, ethnos, where did we find that one? Ethnic group. Uh, and that Matthew explicitly reports the complicity of the entire nation in the rejection of Jesus, demonstrates that Jesus does not intend merely the rejection of the Jewish leadership, but of Israel as a whole. Thus, these denunciations lead on the one hand to the pronouncement against Jerusalem in uh, chapter 23, verses 37-39 of Matthew, when Jesus cries over them, and the Olivet Discourse, uh, chapters 24 and 25, and on the other, to the Great Commission, which allows the gospel to move beyond Israel to all nations in fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant and of Israel's role in the Old Testament. This witness of the new messianic community will continue to the end of the age when Jesus returns. The purpose of the discourses in Matthew is to train the church in discipleship. Another basic and related theme in Matthew is that the only proper response to Jesus is discipleship. To be a member of the Messianic community is to be a disciple or student. And to be a disciple is to obey the teachings of Jesus. In Matthew's gospel, structured as it is around five major discourses of Jesus, is designed to convey that teaching. Thus, each discourse begins with the introductory formula, his disciples came to him, seen in chapter 5, chapter 10, 13, 18, and 24, and concludes with variations of when Jesus had finished these words. <coughs> this makes it Highly unlikely that the teachings of the Olivet Discourse is directed to the disciples as anything but disciples, representatives of those the gospel is designed to instruct. And who was he referencing? The church. Okay. I conclude then that when Jesus warns his disciples of the Danielic abomination of desolation and the great tribulation, he does so as to representatives of the messianic community, the church. And though the rapture itself is not explicitly mentioned in the Olivet Discourse, the most likely reference is the gathering of the elect at the parousia, the coming of the Son of Man. What is important here is that if Matthew expects the church to see the abomination of desolation and the great tribulation, then the rapture must occur after the middle of Daniel's 70th week. 
This point is concern, confirmed in Paul's teaching on the rapture and the return of Christ in the Thessalonian epistles, which is itself a reflection of the tradition underlying the Olivet Discourse. In particular, in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 3 and 4, Paul also identifies the abomination of desolation as the major sign by which the approach of the rapture could be known, thus placing the rapture after the middle of Daniel's 70th week. 2 Thessalonians 2 and 1 Thessalonians 4.15. I'm sorry, that 2 Thessalonians 2 belongs back with the previous slide. 1 Thessalonians 4.15 and 16 places the rapture at Matthew 24.31. The letters to the Thessalonians are unique among the letters of Paul for containing such concentrated and detailed instruction on the parousia, the presence, the coming. Much of this instruction was related orally to the Thessalonians prior to the writing of the letters when Paul first founded the Thessalonian church. This teaching included the certainty of tribulation, the uncertainty of the timing of the day of the Lord, and the fact that certain events must precede the day of the Lord. Those are all in the notes that were sent via email. Paul refers to this teaching as traditions. What he has taught them orally when he was there. Uh, passed on to the Thessalonians by himself and his co-workers Silas and Timothy. And many have noted the probable dependence of at least some of these traditions on those underlying the Olivet Discourse as indicated by the extensive correspondence between Matthew 24 and parallels, Mark and Luke, and the Thessalonian epistles. Thus, in response to a concern raised by the Thessalonians regarding those who fall asleep, Paul reassures his readers that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. The parallels between this passage and Matthew are noteworthy. In both, there are references to the parousia, of Jesus in the clouds to gather saints, accompanied by a trumpet blast and angels. Some of these elements feature into other parousia passages in the Thessalonian epistles as well. For example, Jesus coming with angels, 2 Corinthians 1, 7, and perhaps 3, 13, and is gathering the saints, chapter 2, verse 1, and perhaps uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, chapter 3, chapter 5, and 2 Thessalonians chapters 1 and 2. An especially interesting parallel is 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 through 10, in which there is an emphasis on Jesus' powerful vengeance on his enemies and glorification in his saints when he is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. This evidence indicates that though no rapture is explicitly mentioned in Matthew 24, 31, it is precisely there in the tradition that Paul places the rapture. He states in 1 Thessalonians 4.15 that at least this expansion of the tradition is due to a word from the Lord, whether an agraphon or, or a prophetic utterance, determining, uh, undermining any force to the argument that points to differences between the two texts to deny a connection between them. God told me, Paul says, so... Don't anybody try to, to change what he said. Thus, 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 and 16 confirms my reading of Matthew 24 and suggests that Paul, like Matthew, expects the church to experience the events of the last half of Daniel's 70th week. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 says that the rapture is preceded by the abomination of desolation. The dependence of Paul on the Jesus tradition underlying the Olivet Discourse continues in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 
Compare that to Matthew 24, 13, 15, and 24. Like Matthew 24, 15, Paul points the Thessalonian church to certain signs related to the appearance of the Danielic Antichrist that must precede the coming of Christ to reassure them that the day of the Lord has not arrived. Can't have the day of the Lord until the after the Antichrist sits in the temple. He writes, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or letter supposed to have come from us saying that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. And then this is still the quote. Uh, it should be in italics because it is the passage of Scripture. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? So now we're out of the passage of Scripture. Let's note a few things about this passage, Hultberg says. First, Paul refers to the parousia of the Lord Jesus and our gathering to him as the day of the Lord. The former is language that connects 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 12 to 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 5, 12 and the underlying Jesus tradition. It suggests that when Paul refers to signs prior to the day of the Lord in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 through 4, he means to include the rapture as being preceded by these signs. This is also implied in 1 Thessalonians 5. There Paul continues the discussion regarding the parousia begun in chapter 4. Whereas 4, 13 through 18 was concerned with the relationship of the resurrection to the rapture at the parousia, uh, uh, five, chapter 5, 1 through 11 is addressing the timing of these events and the need for watchfulness on the part of the Thessalonians in light of that timing. Note that Paul refers to the Perusia rapture as the day of the Lord. Okay, that's another important factor in the pre-wrath timeline. Uh, eternity, future, millennium, uh, 70th week, <laughs> 70th week. Um, so remember what I said, middle of it is abomination of desolation, then the uh, wrath of God, and then the day of That's the, their timeline. In the Old Testament, the day of the Lord is that time when God enters history to judge his enemies and sometimes to vindicate his people. In particular, the eschatological day of the Lord is when God will gather the nations for judgment and Israel for salvation and blessing. And here are all these Old Testament passages. The day of the Lord is always seen as a time of judgment. Okay? There is, uh, at the end of, uh, then there is the Israel part of it. When Paul uses the phrase here, he undoubtedly has such passages in mind. For one of the primary features he emphasizes about the day of the Lord, uh, Jesus, he has in parentheses, is the sudden destructions that will fall upon the unbelievers and the wrath in that day from which believers will be spared. Thus Paul can also say in 2 Thessalonians that Jesus will give rest to the church and deal out retribution to the church's enemies on the day 
he is revealed. But more important, it is critical to note that in this passage, Paul explicitly states that the day of the Lord will overtake believers. This conforms, or this confirms that the rapture associated with the parousia in uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 17 is in fact considered by him as part of the day of the Lord. Paul's basic response to the question about the timing of the parousia is that the Thessalonians already know that the day will come like a thief in the night. Chapter 5, verse 2 of 1 Thessalonians. Here, the emphasis is on the unanticipated arrival of the parousia, the coming. Paul elaborates this concept for unbelievers in verse 3. The day will come on them both unexpectedly and destructively. In verses 4 and 5, by contrast, the day will not come upon believers as a thief because they are not in darkness being children of the light and of the day. Walvert argues that Paul means in verse 4 that the day will not overtake believers at all. But this interpretation is unlikely. First, this interpretation does account well for the inclusion of the comparative as a thief if Paul uh, meant to say that the day will not overtake believers, period. Why add as a thief? Walvert understands Paul to mean that the day will not overtake believers as a thief because they do not belong to the same time period, nighttime, to which unbelievers belong. But this does not really solve the problem since Walvert is only accounting for the causal clauses, not the comparative. In effect, it merely has Paul say, but that day will not overtake you as a thief because it has nothing to do with you. The question then remains, why the comparative? Why the as a thief? On Walvert's teaching, Paul did not need to include it. Second, this reading cannot account well for the specific uh, parenesis, the parentheses, to watch and be sober in verse, verses 6 through 8. Walvert makes them general exhortations to the kind of behavior befitting Christians. Because we are day people, let us be sober and alert like day people. But this begs the question, alert for what? Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and bring this up now. Uh, but this begs the question, okay? We will be studying in our, uh, some part of our next week's study, uh, logical fallacies uh, and uh, biases, uh, because that's the only way you can really understand what's going on. Uh, in the passages that we're studying and the, uh, I shouldn't say the passages, the discussion of the passages. And this one brings up one of the fallacies, uh, begs the question, uh, that's not what that means. And we'll look at begs the question next week, but I just wanted to use that opportunity to point out that we'll be studying uh, logical fallacies and see how they figure into the theories of the pre-tribulational and pre-wrath rapture theories. Okay. Um, the context would seem to indicate, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to correct that, but this brings up the question, alert for what? The context would seem to indicate the day of the Lord, but why should Christians be alert for the day of the Lord if it will not overtake them? Finally, understanding Paul to say that believers will not be overtaken by the, day, by the day of the Lord overlooks the connection to the dominical traditions recorded in Luke 21 and Matthew 24. In these passages, the disciples are warned to remain sober and alert so that the day will not come on them suddenly like a trap or a thief. Rather, they are to look up when they see the signs of the parousia for their redemption is drawing near. 
Thus, 1 Thessalonians 5.4 does not seem to mean that believers will not experience the day of the Lord. It is much more probable that this verse means that in contrast uh, to the day of the Lord coming on unbelievers unexpectedly and destructively, the day will not come this way for believers. This is because believers are neither morally liable to its destructiveness nor ignorant of its approach. They are thus to watch for its coming and avoid moral slippage. Verse 9 sums up the discussion by reiterating that though the day overtakes unbelievers by wrath, it will bring believers salvation from wrath. This is similar to 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 8, a passage we noted earlier as related to the Olivet Discourse tradition, where Paul says that the revelation of Jesus from heaven will, be, will bring retribution on unbelievers and rest to believers. 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 and 16, part of the larger context of, of chapter 5, uh, suggests that the salvation to be brought to believers at the Perusia is in fact the rapture. We conclude then from 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 5, 12, that Paul understands two events to occur in relation to the parousia. Jesus will pour out his wrath on unbelievers, and he will rapture his church to allow them to escape that wrath. I think there's room on this page for another little diagram. Okay, this is eternity future. This is the millennium. This, uh, this will be the tribulation period as we have known it, the 70th week. This is the middle of the tribulation period, the abomination of desolation. Okay, so what, what he is saying here is that this period from the abomination of desolation, then, uh, well, he's not saying this, but I will say it for him. Uh, that begins Satan's wrath on the people of God at that time. Remember, when you see the abomination of desolation, uh, of Daniel the prophet, run to the mountains, run to the hills, okay? because then distress will happen like has never happened before. Okay? That's Satan's wrath on the people of God. He's trying to destroy Israel so that God cannot fulfill his promise to Israel, and Satan has to go to the lake of fire eventually. Okay? All right, so then... Uh, that's what Satan's wrath is what the pre-wrath uh, rapture say is the great tribulation. The great tribulation is the time of Satan's wrath. Okay? And then comes the day of the Lord. We call that the D-O-L and God's wrath. So, based on what we've seen so far, this will be the beginning of sorrows. Okay. And then this is the first three and a half years of Daniel's 70th week. So according to the pre-wrath, uh, the church will be here all the way until we get to the God's wrath. Until we get to God's wrath time. Okay. So that means the church will go through the beginning of sorrows, the first three and a half years, uh, all of the seals, uh, the, the white horse, the black horse, the, uh, I'm sorry, the black horse, the red horse, the, uh, I'm sorry, 
the white horse, the red horse, the black horse, and the zombie horse. Okay, that's all in the first three and a half. And, and the abomination of desolation and the wrath of Satan. And then before the wrath of God, that's the rapture of the church. Okay. So that's what they mean by pre-wrath rapture. That the church will go through all of this, the beginning of sorrows, the first three and a half years of the tribulation, the wrath of Satan, everything up to the wrath of God. Because that's the wrath that he delivers us from. So, so now you kind of get a uh, picture of what he's saying here when he says Jesus will pour out his wrath on unbelievers and he will rapture his church to allow them to escape that wrath, the wrath of God. This complex of events Paul refers to. <coughs> We're going to go a little over an hour and then we'll be done. Um, I have done quite well in not commenting on uh, the text. Uh, and th that was my goal, not to do much commenting. Um, and therefore, we're going to get done early, probably another 10 minutes. It's now just been an hour since we started. So if you can hang in for another 10 minutes, we'll get done early today. Uh, this complex of events Paul refers to as the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord. Um, the foregoing makes it extremely probable that when Paul writes 2 Thessalonians 2, concerning the parousia of our Lord Jesus Christ and our, gathered, our being gathered to him, he has one basic event in mind. The same event he spoke about in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5, the coming of Jesus to rapture the church and to mete out judgment on his enemies. Like 1 Thessalonians 5, 1, Paul refers to this event as the day of the Lord. Pre-tribulationalists often see a broader meaning to the day of the Lord. Here, uh, than in 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, and 41, namely the 70th week of Daniel. So what he's saying here is that pre-tribbers see it this way. Um, Eternity, eternity future, the millennium, the 70th week, that pre-tribbers see the entire seven years as the day of the Lord. Okay. Okay. But pre-wrath makes a distinction, makes that distinction. They thus hope to separate the signs of the day of the Lord from the rapture in order to avoid the conclusion that verse 3 gives signs that precede the rapture. Two arguments are given. The first rests on a negative understanding of the phrase quickly shaken from mind or stirred up. Uh, uh, this phrase is taken to mean that due to the tribulation they were experiencing, the Thessalonians were afraid they had missed the rapture and thus should not, uh, should not be in the day of the Lord. Thessalonians thought they were in the day of the Lord is what he's saying. But the phrase is neutral. It can be used negatively or positively. Thus, post-tribulationalists argue that the Thessalonians are excited because they believe the rapture to be on the near horizon. The latter is better because it explains much more easily why Paul answers their misconception as he does in 2 Thessalonians 2. If Paul had taught that the day of the Lord begins at the beginning of the 70th week and is preceded by the rapture, it is hard to conceive of why he points to signs of the second half of the 70th week as reassurance. In fact, Paul says the signs must happen first, before the day of the Lord. Beyond that, if Paul had taught that the day of the Lord began with the tribulation, it would mean that he taught it begins essentially simultaneously with the abomination of desolation. Okay. So now, remember, they say, uh, I'm just, this is just going to be the trib here. 
or the 70th week. And he says that the tribulation doesn't begin until the abomination of desolation. Okay. So he says if they, if the pre-tribulation, let's just say the whole 70th week is the day of the Lord, then it would mean that Paul taught that it begins essentially with the abomination of desolation. Uh, but this would make the teaching about its anticipated but unknown nature in 1 Thessalonians 4 meaningless. We'll see all that when we look at the contradictions and uh, objections to the theory. A sign is required to make it anticipated, but an indeterminate space of time after the sign is required to make it unknown. Okay. So what he's doing here is explaining why it will come like a thief. Uh, know exactly from prophecy that it will begin uh, X number of days after the abomination of desolation. But because there's an indeterminate amount of time in there somehow, uh, that it would be unknown. Okay? Thus Paul probably had taught the Thessalonians that they were subject to the Danielic tribulation. and that they would be raptured at some unknown point from the midst of the tribulation at the outset of the day of the Lord. Remember, the midst of the tribulation for him is uh, not the abomination of desolation, but somewhere in between there, the day of the Lord and the wrath period. Because remember, his, his tribulation is not the full seven years. It is only the last half. <coughs> That's his tribulation, okay? the last half. So the Thessalonians, um, let's see, uh, thus Paul probably had taught the Thessalonians that they were subject to the Danielic tribulation and that they would be raptured at some unknown point from the midst of the tribulation at the outset of the day of the Lord. So Sometime, and he does this, at some point uh, in, in the middle of this three and a half years is when the day of the Lord begins. Okay? So now you have a three and a half and then a three and a half divided into two. Okay? And that, yeah, and that mid some unknown point in the midst of the three and a half years uh, will be at the outset of the day of the Lord. So after the wrath of Satan, but before the wrath of God. Okay. The Thessalonians presumably, presumably had been misled to believe, to, to believe they had been experiencing the Danielic tribulation and that the day of the Lord had now arrived. So he, he speculates here, presumes that the, the Thessalonians think they're somewhere in this second uh, three and a half years. Okay. They thus assumed they were soon to be raptured. Paul argues that the day of the Lord had not arrived, citing as evidence to the contrary the non-occurrences of the signs that must precede that day. And not only the day of the Lord, but the Danielic tribulation as well. The second argument, this was an argument by a fellow named Robert Thomas, given to support a pre-tribulational reading, refers to the syntax of 2 Thessalonians, Thessalonians 2.3. I have edited out Robert Thomas's grammatical argument that the 2 Thessalonians signs appear during the day of the Lord, because it was a poor argument. It was a grammatical, syntactical argument uh, using uh, rare Greek usage. And he said, you know, even though it's rare Greek usage, this, this would be the reason. I left it out. It was, it, was long, it was several slides long, and I said, you, you don't need to hear that. You don't, you don't, uh, you don't care about it. And... <laughs> And it doesn't really add because it wasn't that good of an argument. Okay. Um, 
I have edited out Robert Thomas's grammatical argument that the second Thessalonian signs appeared during the day of the Lord because it was a poor argument. Holdberg's conclusion is interesting, however. This is what he concludes about uh, Thomas's argument. We thus conclude that when Paul gives signs in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, that will precede the day of the Lord, he means these signs to precede the rapture as well. Okay. The second thing we want to note about 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 15 is that the primary sign that must precede the day of the Lord is the abomination of desolation. That this is the case is not immediately clear, however. The connection to the Jewish uh, Jesus tradition again suggests as much. Paul mentions two events in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 that must precede the day of the Lord, the apostasy and the revelation of the son of lawlessness, of the man of lawlessness, who equates to the abomination of desolation. Neither is explicitly explained, Hultberg says, in the context. Verses 9 through 12 offer the most obvious contextual possibility for identifying the apostasy, a satanically inspired departure from the truth associated with the coming of the man of lawlessness. The close connection between the apostasy and the revelation of the man of lawlessness in verse 3 gives considerable force to this identification. But more, the language and concepts of verse 9 through 12 closely parallel Matthew 24, 24 and Mark and Luke passages, forming part of the complex of passages in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5 and 2 Thessalonians 2 that relate Paul's eschatology to Jesus' tradition. Both posit a period of extremely deceptive signs and wonders associated with the figure or figures uh, representing a false Christ. In Matthew, this period is during the Great Tribulation that follows the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. Okay, so that's where we understand from the pre wrath view that, that the satanic uh, signs and wonders all take place after the abomination of desolation and that that is the period uh, of great tribulation. And that's what he essentially assigns to be the wrath of Satan on the people. Okay. Standing in the holy place. Okay, got that. All right, remember the opening of his theses. One, the pre-wrath rapture position rests on two major theses. One, that the church will enter the last half of Daniel's 70th week. And two, that between the rapture of the church and the return of Christ to earth will be a significant period of extraordinary divine wrath. We haven't looked at that yet. Okay. That's what we're going to look at briefly next week before we begin our dissection. Um, we have covered the first and we'll look at the second next week. Okay, So, uh, as you can tell, you're going to have to read over this uh, several times. Uh, because it's a lot of information. It's a uh, head-spinning uh, amount of information. And it is, as you can see, a quite circuitous argument. And I, I, the reason I gave you all of his exact words is that you saw how many times he said, this cannot be proven. This is possible. This is, okay. so, so essentially throughout, he said that we don't know that this is the pre-wrath rapture, uh, but it's the one I conclude is the most logical. Okay. So he has a number of theses. How many theses does he have? Two. 
He has two theses, right? That if he can prove that the church goes through part of the second half of the tribulation, then he's correct. Or if he can uh, prove that after the rapture of the church, in the middle of the second half of the tribulation period, that there's a lot of things that happen, uh, then he's correct. Okay. Um, when I read this, that's when I said, I got to pull out my list of common logical fallacies. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to, uh, I've already started on that project. And the title of it happened here. Did I bring up the wrong? Okay. The theses that are not theses. Because I saw a lot of theses that should have been included. Because there were a lot of things that he assumed to be true for his theses. I'll give you one of them. Um, that Matthew was writing to the church. That since he was writing to the 12 apostles, and the 12 apostles were the ones who were the head of the new community that was replacing Israel, the church, that Matthew was writing to the church. So that says, uh, first one is, um, well, we'll call it church in Matthew. So we'll explore that. We'll explore subsequently. To me, that's the first one. That that is that is the deal maker or the deal breaker. If you're going to talk about the rapture of the church, then you have to know uh, when and where the church is mentioned, discussed, and warned. Okay. All right. So I'm just going to leave you with that. Because I know I've left you with a whole lot of information related to the presentation that can be somewhat confusing. And because you haven't read the information 15 times like I have, <laughs> uh, you've only seen it once. So uh, there is a lot of confusion. But if you read it over several times, You'll see what he's saying, and you'll if you look at the passages on the sheets that I included in your notes and reread all of those references along with him, then you'll see what he's saying. And uh, but uh, I could not help get some of these ideas, like this one and a, a dozen others, out of my thinking as I was reading them. But I did my best not to make comment during the presentation so that I would not be arguing one way or the other about this. But uh, uh, we will look at it and look at the objections. Uh, we'll look at counter arguments from the pre-wrath people about objections and we'll come to a conclusion about what's going on there. Then we're actually going to look um, at the revelation in the context that if, if Matthew was not writing to the church, but writing to the Jews. And if John, uh, the revelator, uh, John who wrote the book of Revelation, if he was writing to the Jews and not the church, what that would mean to our understanding of the rapture. And then we will look at verses that are found in the epistles of Paul during the mystery age to see what he talks about with the rapture.
Okay, so let's close and we'll uh, end for today. Father, we're grateful for our time together. We're grateful for the opportunity to look at this issue, a most divisive issue in today's church, uh, an issue that I see so many pejoratives, so many, so much name calling and, and uh, uh, just terrible way people treat each other. Um, believers not walking in kindness as, as Paul directed from you to the Thessalonians to treat each other the right way. And I see so much of it. So therefore, that's why I want to try to resolve this issue of the two views of the rapture so that we can look at it from your viewpoint and not from a divisive viewpoint. We ask that you bless it as people study, reread their notes, that you'll give them insight into what was said by uh, Hultberg in his presentation of his theory so that uh, when we go through object, uh, objections and contradictions, uh, they'll have reference in their mind of what we're talking about. We ask that you bless our time together and bless everyone who has participated in the name of our Lord, Yahushua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus our Savior. Amen. Almost did it again, Jonah.